Friends, good morning to all. Very warm welcome to our morning worship service today. Let's seek God in worship, shall we? We sing Psalm 94, Scottish Psalter 94. Sing verses 1 to 6. This is page 355, 355. Psalm 94 from the beginning of the psalm. O Lord God, unto whom alone all vengeance doth belong, O mighty God, who vengeance owns, shine forth avenging wrong. Lift up thyself, thou of the earth, the sovereign judge that art, and unto those that are so proud, a due reward in part. This is Psalm 94. Scottish Psalter, let's sing verses 1 to 6. O Lord God, unto whom alone all vengeance doth belong, O mighty God, Shine forth a vengeing wrong. Lift up thyself, thou of the earth, the sovereign judge that art, and unto Together, let's pray and seek God together. Lord our God, we do give thanks for this new day and for the time you've given us to meet like this and to gather around your word to listen to what you say to us. And the wonder for us, Lord, is that you listen to us as well. But with Paul, it's so often the case, and when he told the Roman church, we don't know, he said, what to pray for as we ought. What he should say and how he should say it was something he struggled with. But there as well, we thank you that he records for us the role of the Holy Spirit, making intercession in us with groanings that are too deep for words. And you who know the mind of the Spirit you who search the heart, you know the mind of the Spirit and that he makes intercession for the saints according to your will. How mysterious, how wonderful for us to be in, in any way involved in praying in line and in harmony with what you're planning and willing. Sometimes we may have your word and the promises you give us and the guidance so we, in that sense, will know your will, know our duty and know your intention and what you want from us at that time. But other times we might never know. But only afterwards, 
and the reason for the burden makes sense and the answer comes through and at the time maybe we couldn't understand but to learn from these things and to keep praying and with that confidence we thought last Sunday morning in passing with Elijah your servant and how it was persistence in praying so much when he had your mind and will already on the situation which in a sense it makes us stop and, and think about that whole situation although the, he knew the answer was coming because he told Elijah the rain was on its way there wasn't a cloud in the sky and he kept praying until it appeared the servant told him the cloud was but the size of a man's hand but that itself after praying these seven times was clear evidence to the prophet that your word and will were coming to pass and sometimes lord we maybe feel we're looking for that cloud but we're not praying for rain in the same sense but looking for your answer and blessing and sometimes it, it, it can be for years or for, or for maybe if not for years or what feels like years but you are giving us prayer and you know the prayers that have ascended gone up to you from this house over many 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 years and we believe that you still in the fullness of your time and appointment answer prayer and while we might feel or, or imagine or maybe not imagine so much as even feel or even fear that when you take we can think of it maybe in our families you take your people away and people we maybe grew up being prayed for by and being remembered and but we remind ourselves lord that it is such a mystery for us that how in time as it progresses and the perfect time comes sometimes the prayers others have offered come to come to be answered and that though it's not the same thing so much as prayer we remember your people in Egypt and in their, in their struggling and in their bondage and Moses records for us that you remembered Abraham you thought of him it's not that you ever forgot him but in that way of speaking for us to understand a bit more and in a fuller way you show in these human terms that you are faithful to your promises and faithful to your word and the fact of sending deliverance through Moses into Egypt was these hundreds of years after you had announced to Abraham in that vision where the sacrificial animals were divided and and he had to, and watched you in that symbolism pass between them binding your own very existence to fulfilling your promises to him and that promise included his descendants being strangers in a foreign land until the time for their deliverance which we do give thanks happened with Moses and so in our lives though we maybe shudder or struggle to make comparisons sometimes you've given us your word to do just that among other things that you are the God who answers and while none of us are in Moses's or or Elijah's positions we believe like from James the letter you gave him to write that he uses Moses as an uh, uses Elijah as an example of prayer and the fact that he was a human like the rest of us but we do acknowledge and see your great and abundant grace in his life and in the lives throughout scripture and of how differently it can look at times and how it was with with um Rahab and how unlikely she may be looked or seemed or maybe felt and to her own attempt at, at observing the way she describes her faith to the spies who sent and how she hides them and sends them away that's the very thing that you commend of her in the new testament how variously how differently things can look and how circumstances and life may be far from straightforward or or easy when your grace comes in it may be an illness or, or times of sorrow through loss and mourning and bereavement but whatever it is that you use whether in our lives or the lives of those around us you work perfectly 
And though we're so slow to learn and listen, you teach us so amazingly. Lord, we give thanks for your patience and pray that you continue with us. And as we come to open your word today, we seek and pray. We hope that we come to learn from you, to listen to what you may be saying to us. And we pray that we draw nearer to you through your mighty power as we come face to face with you in Scripture again. Thank you for everyone present. We give thanks for being here and being able to be here. Remember those who are not able to. Praying, Lord, for all who are uh, confined and unable to, to get out as much or at all anymore. We're praying, Lord, for where there's sickness. Praying for healing. Again, that amazing section in James where he talks about Elijah and how in illness. I wonder, Lord, Lord, if we actually believe it sometimes. But he says, if anyone is sick, let them call for the elders of the church and to pray for them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Maybe we're too scared, or maybe not that we are in any way, but maybe think in a different direction. Maybe prayer is the last thing we do to gather with each other in sickness. And, and so give us wisdom, we pray, Lord, and, and for the, the prayerfulness and the glorious discovery of answered prayer where there is illness and sickness and praying that you will raise them up again and give strength and give perseverance in, in the midst of trial and difficulty. Thank you for the children and the young ones. We pray for them, Lord, as they're growing up, that you will use your word here and whatever it's, uh, whatever they are exposed to it, and you'll protect them and their minds and their outlooks and everything, providing friends, provide stability, provide guidance and careers and Above everything, Lord, that they will come to know you and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and to serve you as faithful and as bright and shining witnesses and that they'll grow up remembering the grounding in Sunday school and home and church and YF and older ones being able to meet up in the cafe. We pray for all that's done for everyone involved and so much behind the scenes of what's what's seen so often in the church it's the case and so Lord to be encouraged whatever anyone finds their hand to do they be encouraged that they're doing it as unto the Lord remember communion services throughout the islands today and in these coming weeks asking for your blessing in these special times of being able to focus our minds and our attention our hearts to try and do this in remembrance of you so help us, Lord, as we gather round your word today and, as it were, join the procession to the, uh, to the cross and hear what people say and what you say to them and to, to embrace your truth for our lives. So remember us and all who are in any need. Grant your blessing, Lord, on those who are away as well and take care of them. And watch over us all, we ask. Take away all our sin. Hear us as we ask and ask in everything. In Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. Continue singing. Let's turn to Psalm 69. Messianic Psalm 69. This is Scottish Psalter. We can turn page 305, verses 1 to 4. Psalm 69, page 305. And at verse 1. Save me, O God, because the floods do so environ me, that even unto my very soul come in the waters be. I downward in deep mire do sink, where standing there is none. I am in the deep waters come, where floods have over me gone. Let's sing verses 1 to verse 4. Psalm 69, Save me, O God. Save me, O God, because the floods do so environ me, that even unto my very soul come in the waters be. I 
downward in deep mire to sink where standing there is none I am into deep waters come where floods have o'er me gone I weary with my crying am my throat is also dried mine eyes do fail while for my God I waiting to abide those men that do with a dark horse bear hatred unto me than are the on my head in number more they be they that would me destroy and are mine enemies wrong fully are mine so what I took not to render forced was I well, let's read together Matthew's gospel we can read chapter 27 Matthew 27 there's a section in, in Luke We'll refer to God willing, but uh, we'll read in Matthew. Matthew 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And he said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed, and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It's not lawful to put them into the treasury since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the piece, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear him any things they testify against you? But he gave them no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast... The governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? But he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, I have nothing to do with this with, with uh, that righteous man, for I've suffered much because of him today in a dream. 
Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put, on his, and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put a charge, the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man's calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly this was the Son of God. There were also many women there looking on from a distance who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. And when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut on the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb the next day, that is, after the day of preparation. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, we remember how that impostor said while he was still alive, after three days, I will rise. Therefore order, that, therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead. Now, the last fraud 
will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go, make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. And so on from there. May God bless his word to us. Let's turn to Psalm 95 just now. Sing Psalms 95. And from verse 6. You can sing down to the end. Psalm 95 at verse 6. is page 126 in the blue books, in the psalm books. Come, let us bow humbly and worship the Lord. Let us kneel before him, our maker, in prayer, for we are his people, and he is our God. He shepherds and feeds us in his loving care. Let's sing to the end of the psalm. Come, let us bow humbly and worship the Lord. Let us kneel before him, our maker in prayer. For we are his people, and he is our God. He shepherds and feeds us in his loving care. Today, if you hear and attend to his voice, don't harden your hearts as you did on the way. In Meribah's desert, you quarreled with me. You tested my patience at Massa that day. Your fathers provoked me and tested me there. Although they had witnessed the works I had done with that generation, for forty long years my deep indignation continued to burn i said there are people whose hearts go astray they do not acknowledge that my ways are best and so in my anger I stated on oath I swear that they never shall enter my rest Let's turn back, shall we, to Matthew, Matthew 27 and that we can read again uh, words we've got here in verse 32, Matthew 27, verse 32, and as we read, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to bear his cross. Mark has a little bit of a detail to add when he refers to Simon of Cyrene refers to him as a man. This is in Luke, uh, sorry, Mark 15, 21. He compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father, notice Mark says, of Alexander and Rufus. They compelled him to carry Jesus' cross. There's something we'll maybe in a minute or two see about this. This man called uh, Simon of Cyrene, who it would seem became a greatly influential person. A, a random, almost, circumstance that just kind of happened, something that just came into his life. He was, we're told by, by um, we're told by Mark here that this man, Simon, was on a journey. He was coming in from the country. He didn't live in Jerusalem. He was, by being referred to as being of Cyrene, he tells us where he's from. It's modern-day Libya. If that makes any sense, the younger one's thinking at the top of around that way of Africa. And uh, 
Some people have wondered whether he was actually from there or whether he lived there, and they try and figure out much more about him than maybe we're actually told. He could very likely have been with other Jews, someone who had moved. Maybe historically there was quite a population of Jews in Cyrene there, but the thing for us to, to try and notice and to try and hopefully follow on where this is going, the main event, as you know, I think we've come to see, and, and, and a lot of the details are recorded in Matthew 27, so we've been on and off reading this chapter because of, you know, the details leading up to the cross, the things that are taking place, with the, the, the episode, the, the life situation with this man, Simon of Cyrene, is a, by itself, never mind, what, in a sense, what happened or the outcome that seems to have happened, the situation itself is a wonderful thing to notice. And for any, any one of our lives, any one of us, to maybe stop and look back, if we have to look back, and think, even in the present, if it's ongoing, at the hand of God in our lives. It reminds, it reminds us, uh, in a sense, and I'm not sure if the children remember, maybe remember this, well, that probably, uh, probably not the translation of it anyway, but I'll respectfully speak of the older ones. You might remember, uh, any of us who, who, who are more familiar, memory-wise, with the... Um, the old translation that sometimes it got a poetic almost rhythm to it that you can, without trying to remember it, it sometimes sticks. Anyway, even the way it went in the book of Ruth, we're, we're told about in the book of Ruth that when she was out trying to help provide a source of income or, or uh, existence for her mother-in-law, we're told that her hap was to light upon the field of Boaz. Now, to translate the translation for younger ones, it basically means she happened. She happened to, you know, when we say it happened or um, something's happy or it's favorable. Well, she just seemed to make the choice in her life that day and just happened to make her way into a field that would end up being, uh, being owned by someone who would completely change her life and her mother-in-law's life and who would even become one who God would use according to the flesh in order for the Christ to ultimately be born of Mary. It's amazing. She just happened to go to this field. In your life, when you're growing up, you're making choices that maybe seem small. You know, to, co to, to cover and to do everything prayerfully. And and that's not, not the way it sounds, but to pray with your, well, you can. Some people do. It's more comfortable, less distracting, maybe strangely, to pray with your eyes open. But by praying with your eyes open is the sense of looking for God in your life. Well, you're asking and committing your way to him in the morning, for example, and praying for guidance and for help, for blessing and everything that you're going to do. Then it's to be on the lookout for God doing these things. And then, you know, to have that kind of fellowship and that walk with God. One of the reasons for drawing our attention to this is what happens to this man, Simon. He's not at home. He's at a religious festival. And in being at this festival and being in a different place, he just happens to be walking past a crowd coming in from the country. So we know where he's been from. He's coming into the center of Jerusalem. And without him realizing... This is how it seems. Without him realizing, one of the most amazing and one of the most life-changing events is taking place just in front of him. And God will use that very point in time where he's going past the exhausted Jesus and he's grabbed by soldiers and he's forced. He doesn't offer to do anything. He's walking past, he's grabbed, and he's made to carry the cross for Jesus. Now, in some respects, while it wouldn't be the case of saying guilt by association, it could for an ordinary person in that context be an incredibly humiliating thing to have to do. But it was, we believe, blessed to him. It's never to look at any situation in life and think of it as wasted or as useless or as... It's different for us to 
to make sense of it. You remember last the place we were and a, a woman who had, well, a, a young woman had passed away. It was through complications following um, childbirth. And somebody, a Christian person, saying at that time, I can't see anything good coming from this. But that's not for us to do, is it really? It'll add to the trauma of a situation if we try and figure out what God may be saying or doing. When sometimes it's just with all the enormity of that situation of, of trying to accept that it has happened. Bad, bad enough, isn't it? And, and hard enough. The, the difficulty, you know what's sad as well, I think I've mentioned that, and, 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 and it was in a completely different situation. That Christian woman who said that about the one who passed away, she passed away herself. And, uh, it, 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 you know, it was somewhat inevitable, you might say, in a very sad way. But the, the thing with Simon, you notice with Simon, there's no such thing as random chance luck. We use these words sometimes, and, you know, some, sometimes we can be really critical of people who use a certain word. It may be an opportunity to say, well, no, God is in control, but it's, when we say a word, we know what we mean by them. But with the, the way we can get used to hearing people saying, you know, really lucky and really fortunate and, and things like that. We can ourselves, if we, if we drink in, as it were, and soak in that mindset, there's parts of us that can become numbed by way of interpreting life. We can look at maybe at life, and, and can't, can't this be the case? Has it ever taken you a wee while longer than, than, you, than and to your own maybe shock to, to give thanks for something the Lord has done? You've been really praying about something, and then the answer comes, say, on a given day, and, and you tell someone first, or you, or you think about it, and then you give thanks. We're kind of slow. And why that is, there, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's something, there's a spiritual sluggishness about us. Christians, there's, there's, I don't know, it almost feels like spiritually, we sometimes, most of the time, maybe feeling that we're dragging ourselves along. By way of making attainment, if that's the word. It's a word that Paul uses writing to the Philippines, not that I had already attained this or were already perfect, but one thing I do. He describes them to have a, a stretching forth, reaching forth to what is ahead and what's be above and beyond. It's like someone, you know, it's like someone trying to grasp hold, reaching out. Someone said that his reach exceeds his grasp. He's always reaching, but he's never able to feel the full satisfaction of getting hold of, and what he's talking about is getting hold of Christ and having that personal fellowship and that reality of experience where he speaks about that I might know him, the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of his resurrection, being made conformable to a death like his. He died for me, Paul, saying I would gladly die and suffer for him. I mean, how spiritual is that? And he said, the one thing I do, I forget what's behind. He's reaching forward. And, and in the sense of non-attainment, it's not the sense of, dis, of being unhappy, but, you know, there's the sense where, just the sense where maybe in, in, in life it's possible for us to become, you know, dulled down or anesthetized in a way. Because we hear about things, and, and this is, this is, you know, we can become bombarded without us realizing we can be numb spiritually. And so, it, to maybe have that rediscovery of sorts, even today, if it hasn't been obvious, it's to look back and, you know, we were maybe told about counting our blessings. Does it make sense to, to kind of do that now? To, to notice maybe where there is blessing, where we wouldn't have expected it or thought there was none. Our Lord has been subjected to such humiliation and shame. We're told about the way the, the soldiers now begin to mock him. And uh, we've had that in verse 27 and following. Pilate is doing everything, everything in his power, you might say, um, to get rid of the Jewish accusation and allegation against Jesus. He's trying everything. He's scared. He's, he's cowardly and he's pretty spineless. Not that he's not a ruthless person. It's not that he wasn't renowned for doing terrible things. It's that he didn't have any principles. You know, he, he, he was like that, it seems. 
because he's scared, we're told in the account of putting the Gospels together. He's scared on one occasion, not on another occasion. But here he is. And he delivers him, we're told, over to be scourged and delivered him over to be crucified. Now, the soldiers, they did such humiliation and acts of such mockery and, and ridicule. But see how the Bible says in verse 26, having scourged Jesus, and then says the end of verse 26, crucified. These two things, we'll not think of just now, but when it comes to God willing, considering crucifixion, what it involved, and so on. The Bible just covers it in a word. And there's a sense where one reason we can think of, I'm not saying it's the reason for it, but because we're so geared to be somewhat, you know, there's that in us that, not that we want it or choose it, but, but be, this is another thing related to kind of spiritual sluggish. And sluggish this isn't maybe the right word, but there's a, there's a difficulty for sure on our part of making sense of things, of trying to make sense. Because so much of what, because we're human and we process reality in our brains through our physical senses, is that we seem to maybe have, pardon the kind of pun unintended, more of a grasp of something, the more we're aware of it. Faith is a phenomenal thing. How it gets hold of the promises of God, of the existence of God, both of whom, among other things, we cannot actually see. And um, to be able to see something, to be able to hold on to something, there's a sense where that wouldn't be faith anymore. But hope that is seen is not hope, we're told in the Romans. But if we wait for what we, but if we wait for what we don't see, then we, with, we, we will with patience wait for it, we'll hope for it, we'll expect for it. Faith, Hebrews 11, we, by faith, you know, we can see, like Moses did, the God who is invisible. But having something tangible, what we're meaning trying to get to, is sometimes people feel they need to see something of his sufferings or imagine something of his sufferings, physical sufferings, that is. Now, they were massive, and um, there's, there's no questioning any, any of that. But what's happening in his crucifixion is, in, in one sense, it's, it's partial to the whole situation. The symbolism of crucifixion for the Jew he was symbolically, our Lord was symbolically under the curse of God. Crucifixion as a form of execution. Go back to Deuteronomy and it speaks there. It's quoted in Galatians. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's a big part why they were mocking him and ridiculing him and saying what they said. Because he was in a position that was opposite to his claims. If you are the son of God. Come down from the cross. Save yourself. And they couldn't figure this out. But see, we're being led, I think, somewhere deeper into this by the simple reference of scourged and crucified. What happens in verse 27 down to 31 is, is of such a magnitude, everything put together, that the Lord isn't able to carry the cross anymore. That's all we need to know. The scourging, the beating, everything, the blood loss, the trauma at different levels. Throughout, a, well, he'd have had, a, no doubt, a sleepless night. He was dragged before one hearing after another and mocked and ridiculed. And, and to be scourged and to be having mock robes put on him and a crown of thorns and to be beaten on the head. And he's taken. And as he's led away, this is the point we see. He's physically exhausted. He can't carry the cross anymore. Part of the shame was carrying it. And part of the shame as well in carrying the cross would be leading, leading you along this journey of humiliation and shame and rejection. A public place. A spectacle and... How amazing, how silent he is. We're going to, God willing, come to what he says. As soon as 
the nails are put into him. We know of the, the, the first of our Lord's sayings through the crucifixion. It's what he's thinking, what was on his mind, what was on his heart. First thing to come across just now towards that is think about this, this man. Um, this man, uh, they've compelled, and it would seem they've taken against his will, Simon of Cyrene. They found a man. Now put yourself in this man's shoes, and we'll see just why that's so important. You're just going around your work, and you're very like your business by your work. You're going around. This is a religious festival, and crucifixion wouldn't have been extraordinary. Wouldn't have been out of the out of the ordinary for um, these kind of trials and, and, and for capital crimes and death sentences to be carried. The Romans had perfected this form of execution and as well as it being such a brutal, horrific form of suffering. There's also the shame associated, is there not? Which Jesus, does he not say, and what a, what a challenge to us. That if anyone would come after me, he said, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Self-denial. The challenge in all of that and how it applies, the cross-bearing is symbolizing that who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Put these two things together, two kind of emotional reactions to situations, shame and despising. And in his sufferings and in the humiliation, it's not, it's not like someone trying to get rid of it. It's someone who has come to that place in their acceptance of it. despising the shame. He's taken it willingly, gladly. He's the man of sorrows. He's acquainted with grief. He's the one who's being rejected by everyone around him on earth. He's the one who feels he's been rejected by heaven. And there is an isolation. There is a shamefulness. And it's, it's not like you or me saying, you know, if we did something and then we're like, you know, if if we're caught or cornered or even, I mean, by even like, like David when he numbered the people and his heart struck him and smote him. It's not the sh having shame as a result of doing wrong and despising it in the sense of saying, well, I'm not going to let that bother me. That could, be, that could be lethal in your life. In the sense of whatever it is when we choose not to let it bother us. We think we've dealt with it when we maybe haven't. And it's under the surface and we keep a lid on it and it raises its ugly head and we maybe try and, you know, like someone who's, who's wrong or I've wronged someone and they'll say, I haven't, it's not me, it's not my fault. And then you know how that can be and last such a long time, maybe a lifetime. When our Lord is said to despise the shame, I think it's by way of, you know, when you weigh things in the balance, in the sense of the shame is nothing. He viewed the shame as nothing given what was coming and given the glory that was coming. I think Philippians 2 highlights that for us as well, does it not? It's that when he, he humbled himself, he humbled himself as low as he could possibly do so in order to come, though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor so that we, through his poverty, might be rich. The shame was nothing to him in the sense of it's not the thought of someone being so dignified and glorious. Philippians to me is a clear. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He didn't see the thing with its shame. And we cannot, you know, the, the proudest people, when you see people who've arrived or they've whatever, it's like the Lord teaches. So often people are, they, they think that other people are there to serve them or you know, to do your will or whatever it is. The Son of Man, he said, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. The self-sacrifice and the giving was involving shame. Though he was in the highest position and is in the highest position imaginable, it's where the theology gets confusing to try and keep things in boxes if that's what we're doing, because though he is... In the highest position eternally, he became in becoming man. 
God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, Mary, made under the law in submission, subjection to keep it in its terms and in its requirements and in its penalty. He did this to redeem those who were under the law. Jesus despised the shame. Why? Because of the joy that was set before him. So there's an evaluation of sort, not sitting down and thinking what's more important, but th this is to do thy will, I take delight. That was him. Read it if you'd wish to follow. We read it in Hebrews, him saying that even before he was born, as he is coming into the world. Yes, it's quite a thought that. For the, sh the shame for the Lord, it was different. The shame for you, this Simon, you might think, well, that would be quite... He wouldn't have a choice in it, of course. It's not that he would decide whether he wants to do this or not. But the thing to notice in, in, in our lives is God places us exactly where we are. Every single... The decisions we make, we make the choices to be in a place at a time. You decide your... There's everything. You think of all the little choices that got you to, he, to here today. And, and that maybe questions or, you know, ifs or buts or doubts or certainties the process think of it and you made the choices when you're younger others made the choice for you but you know it's ultimately because it's happened it's God who's made the choice we know from Ephesians 1 that he works everything according to the purpose of his own will we have no idea picture in Revelation 5 is of a scroll that's gradually opened and as it's gradually opened events are taking place a picture of history god is in control of ex christ is pictured the lord is pictured as being in control from heaven in his ascension all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth he says and at uh, the end of matthew 28 where he gives the great commission and sometimes you know this you think of that even david making the king david the choices he made to end up in none other town than Gath, where Goliath was born and bred. And David on the run from King Saul, you remember, you remember the story, when he's going away from Saul, what does he do? He goes straight into the pathway of the, his greatest enemy, the king of Gath. And he went there holding Goliath's sword, thinking, this is my defense. Anyone looking at David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, you're like, David, what are you doing? You, you have the promise from God that you're going to be king, that you're going to succeed Saul. But you've just said a step is between me and death. He said, if I don't go, I'm finished. And someone's going to pull David back and say, please listen to this. God has promised you nothing's going to happen. But he says, no. So he hits a panic. And in the panic, he goes, gets the bread from the priest at Nob, and then he gets Goliath's sword, and he's seen. And the person who sees him goes behind his back and tells Saul. And then the whole thing seems to fall apart. But this is what we're saying. We're trying to notice in it. It's out of that situation that Psalm 34 came. The situation where David, we're told, when he gets to, to, to Gath and he hears the this is the one the women were singing about. Oh, Saul slew his thousands. David has slain his tens of thousands. And then he started realizing, I'm in a lot of trouble here. So he pretends he's lost his mind. And he starts scratching on the door. And he lets saliva come down his beard. And he's giving this impression. It's not true. He's in his right mind, though, in a manner of speaking. He hasn't been. But he's certainly not the man who's out of his mind he's pretending to be so when we're singing about psalm 34 the angel of the lord in camps they look to him enlightened where and amazingly this is it as well the end of psalm 34 has a messianic promise that only john refers to it says not a bone of him shall be broken that's psalm 34 that's the psalm david wrote when he was pretending to be mad when he wasn't mad when he'd run away from place of safety with Goliath's sword in his, as it were, over his shoulder, trying to find refuge with the Philistines. It doesn't add up or make sense, but does your life add up and make sense? Does it all make sense? 
You know, are we too long kind of thinking the Christian life is all about, you know, the dotted I's and the stroke T's, but really there's no one prepared to say, you know what, things aren't the way. Like David would say, he said, though my house is not so with God. Have, have, have your own ideals or mine, have they kind of collapsed? Well, that's not a bad thing. It's to find God's ideal and God's plan for how things can work out from now. It's never the end. Simon of Cyrene is referred to by Mark, who wrote, it's believed, his gospel, particularly for Christians in Rome. Mark says this, makes this reference, that, um, that Simon's the father of Rufus and Alexander, who were obviously well known to the readership of Mark's gospel, and then you come to Romans 16. Now, anyone's good at joining dots and young ones, pulling all these things together. It's fascinating to see how this works out. Simon, Mark says, has two sons, Rufus and Alexander. In Romans 16, a man called Rufus is mentioned. Someone who Paul speaks of in, in uh, very positive terms like someone who is an heir of life but then he speaks also about his mother who was a mother to me as well the picture is simon married to this woman the two boys rufus and his mother are still alive in rome it seems by the time paul's writing the letter to them joining all of that up the thought is the same rufus is mentioned in romans 16 as in mark 13 mark 15 which the argument goes, being compelled to carry the cross of Jesus, led to this man being remembered in Rome many years afterwards. That's quite amazing. So who'd have thought that just happening to be seized hold of to carry the cross after Jesus could, if we have the right person, Simon of Cyrene, if that could have been instrumental in his own conversion, and the conversion of his family, his wife, and the two boys. Isn't that amazing. Nothing happens by chance. And being forced into the worst you can imagine of situations, having to carry the cross of this criminal behind him, guilt by association, the shame that it could otherwise bring. The Lord used it, we believe. And He can use anything in your life and my life. And sometimes it's looking at the most unlikely things, isn't it? Things we look at as being impossible for God to do anything with. But we have to remember, he is the God who created light to shine out of darkness. And the one we're told in Hebrews 11, who, make, who out of weakness, he makes people strong. He does what he's going to do with what isn't there to start with. It's not there to start with. But God does his miracles through that. And if he'll use any one of us, what a wonderful thing. We'll think of Simon. And think of his providence. And how the Lord used it in his life. Let's pray just now. Let's pray. Help us, Lord, to stop. Help us to be still. And to recognize, to know that you are God. And that there are no chance things we look at our lives and look at the decisions we or others have made and there might be times we wonder what just wondering what could have been if certain cho if we thought this or thought that and there's sometimes too where that you've clearly made the decision for us and these answers are amazing so, like you say in Revelation, you, start, you said before us, open doors no one can shut, closed doors no one can open. And any seeking that certainty, give it, we pray. That guidance and that assurance of hearing the voice behind us, saying, this is the way, walk in it. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing Psalm 100. In conclusion, 100. Psalm 100 and Scottish Psalter, Psalm 100, page 362.
All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth, his praise forth tell, come ye before him and rejoice. Let's sing the whole psalm, Psalm 100. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice, him serve with mirth his praise forth of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.